Well, good morning, church family. It's always uh, an honor to be able to share God's word with you. And as Corey said, I'll be in Psalm 34 today. So if you want to take your Bibles, you can turn there with me. But before we get into Psalm 34, I'm going to begin by saying a scary word. Actually, I'm going to start by saying two scary words. So please prepare yourself and any young ones that might still be with you this morning. Here we go. Those two words are dust, might. Yes, I said it. Dust, might. They're real. And there's a high probability they're in your house, in your bed right now, just waiting for you to come home and go to bed. How many of you have ever been woken up in the middle of the night because of a nightmare with thousands, if not millions, of dust mites crawling all over you? Well, you might be tonight after I finish showing you some things. I want to start off by giving you a visual idea of what a dust mite looks like. So we have a picture here to show you. Um, if your eyesight's good, you might be able to see that little, little dot on the screen. That's not a dust mite. The dust mite is actually on top of the dot. And yes, they're invisible to the naked eye. So they're not really that terrifying unless you start to really blow them up. So I have another picture of what a dust mite looks like, magnified over 2,000 times. And there's the, the pretty creepy crawly right there. As you can see, they have eight legs, no eyes. It's pretty nasty looking. They have a great sense of smell and what they love to eat that they can smell all over our skin flakes and mold. Yummy, yummy. Uh, scientists tell us that 84% of all homes have dust mites in them. And yet, ironically, probably 99% of you are thinking you're one of those 16% who doesn't have dust mites in their house. I'd like to tell you the odds are not in your favor. And unfortunately, these guys don't ever live by themselves. Um, the average used mattress, scientists tell us, have between 10,000 and 10 million dust mites inside them. I have another picture of what their friends look like. So again, that's magnified over 2,000 times. Now the good news is, and this is good news, dust mites do not bite people. The bad news is, is that during their roughly three-month lifespan, they will produce over 2,000 fecal particles. And yes, I did say fecal particles in church. And on top of that, they have, they'll produce over 2,000 partially digested enzyme-covered particles. And so that means roughly 84% of Americans tonight, while they sleep, will be crawled on, pooped on, and thrown up on by thousands, if not millions, of these creepy crawlies. Now you know why I think dust mites are so terrifying. Have fun sleeping tonight, folks. Okay, you read the picture now. All right, so what did I just do? All right, so before you came in here this morning, you probably had no idea what a dust mite looked like. You probably didn't think about dust mites whatsoever. But I just magnified the dust mite for all of us this morning. I told you about their existence. I showed you a picture of what they look like. I told you about their nature, what they enjoy, what they, what they like to do. And that's how we glorify and magnify something. So obviously we're here in church to do that for the Lord, right? And so how do we magnify how do we magnify the Christ? Well, I can't show you a picture of what Jesus fully looks like or what God in all of his glory looks like because as Indiana Jones proved to us, our faces would be melted off if we saw God's glory for all that it is. But we can talk about God's existence. Though we can't see him, he is indeed there. And we can talk about God's nature and what he, what he is and who he is and what he wants to do for our lives and in our lives and through our lives. And we can certainly look to the Bible, which is the greatest place of all to magnify God from. And so we're going to do that today. Psalm 34 is one of my favorite psalms, and I'm going to do it in justice. Uh, it's like if, if Psalm 34 were in orange, I'm going to squeeze some of it out for us, but there's so much more we could get from this psalm. So hopefully you'll have some time in your personal walk with the Lord this week to really get back into the psalm. But the first three verses set the table for what this psalm is about. So let's begin by looking at those verses together. It starts off by saying, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And so you can see from those first few verses that the main idea of this entire psalm is that there are numerous reasons indeed to continuously praise and magnify the Lord. So with our time together today, we're going to look at five reasons that this psalm points out. And again, there's more to this psalm than, than this. But hopefully by the time you get home tonight, your soul and your mind will be so blessed by God and, and, and glorifying Him and magnifying Him so much that you'll be able to sleep peacefully tonight, despite all the little creatures crawling on top of you. 
So let's begin by looking at the first reason mentioned here to, to praise God and to magnify Him, which is found in verses 4 through 7 and verse 17. It says, I sought the Lord, and He answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to Him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Again, there's so much in there, but to, to, to summarize it all, one reason today, the first reason we should praise God and magnify the Lord is because he hears our prayers and he delivers us. Amen? I mean, it's a really big deal that God actually is involved in our lives and that he hears us when we pray. And it's not like God is only listening to the prayers of people like Brian or world leaders or the rich and famous. I mean, it says here that God even pays attention and listens to the prayers of the poor. And I know some of us in here this morning might think, oh, I'm, I'm poor, I don't have a lot, I don't have a lot. But if you have multiple sets of clothes, multiple shoes, you have access to clean running water, you have a, a roof over your head and, and, and windows and doors and locks, then you may not be rich, but you're certainly not poor. Poor 3,000 years ago when this psalm was written, you had just one set of clothes and you had just one pair of shoes and you had no running water. And, and maybe if you're lucky, you had a tent to sleep in if you're on the, the high end of the poor spectrum. If you're on the low end of the poor spectrum, you either slept in a cave or just under a tree. Those are the kind of people that nobody noticed, nobody cared about. If you lived or died, no one really thought much about it. And yet we're told here that, that God noticed, God cared, God was a part of their lives, and God was willing and able to hear them and to answer them. And verse 4 says that God answered and delivered me from all of my fears. And, and I admit there's a lot of things in life a lot more scary than, than dust mites. Let's be honest here. There are some things that we worry about that are indeed big and heavy, right? But we serve a God who is bigger and heavier than all those things. And we should be, take comfort in that. Because indeed God does hear us and answer us and deliver us from all of our fears. And why? Because he's actively involved in your life and mine. In 2005, a sociologist named Christian Smith was doing a lot of studying on the, the spiritual beliefs of young people. And he, he coined a phrase that Pastor Ryan has used before. The phrase that he coined that is best described in his mind that the belief system of America's youth in the early 2000s was that of moralistic therapeutic deism. And that's a mouthful. But he said it was moralistic because for them, the main idea of religion was to teach, them, teach people morals, how to be good, because that's how you get to heaven, by being a good person. And then he said people believe in this therapeutic idea of God because what's the purpose of religion? Well, it's to help people feel better about themselves and their problems. And then he used the term deism because most young people in the early 2000s felt that, that God was more or less in the background of their lives. He wasn't involved in the day in and day outs. Uh, yeah, he was available if you had an emergency, but he really wasn't making any, many, many demands on your life and really didn't care all that much unless, again, you really cried for help. And that was the early 2000s. Now, George Barna, if you don't know that name, he's a Christian researcher. He's kind of been a modern prophet to the church the last 30 years, telling us what's going on in our, in our culture. And in 2001, George Barna published a study that was not just about youth, but it was now about all Americans. And he actually used that same phrase as the best descriptor of what Americans now as a whole, more than anybody else, like over 50% of Americans now, this is their definition of how they view God that he's this moralistic, therapeutic, deist kind of mentality. And if you think about our country, that makes a lot of sense because that's the mess we're in right now. This idea that God's not very involved in our lives. We can do whatever we want to do as long as it makes me happy. And we're making a lot of very selfish choices collectively, which leads ultimately to an unfulfilled life. And as a country, we're very unhappy. We're very angry people as a country right now. And so we need a different view of God. We need the, the correct view of God based on who he is and who he tells us he is, like here in Psalm 34. And in verse 7, uh, I love the phrase, it says that the angel of the Lord, and it says the angel, not an, an angel, the angel of the Lord, which most theologians refer to as Jesus, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear God. And that word fearing God is about respecting God and, and obeying him and holding him in awe and respect. But 
But here, though, he encamps around those who fear him. And my wife loves to camp. I can't help but when I read a verse like this to think of a campfire where you and Jesus are making s'mores together because he's encamped with you. And in a few minutes from now, when we dismiss, you know, Jesus, as you go to your car, is going to be walking with you to your car. And later on, when you get home, when you walk in, he's going to be walking in the door with you. And when you're at the, well, in the living room watching whatever you're watching, Jesus is going to be in the living room watching whatever you're watching with you. And that's why when you pray, whether you're rich or poor, God's going to be right there to hear you. And he's going to watch over you and answer you and deliver you. And that's a pretty big reason to magnify and praise God today. So that's one of four reasons, or one of five reasons. There's a lot more here. So let's go to the next next set of reasons to praise God. And that's found in verses 8 through 10. And I love, love verse 8. Um, this whole psalm is just so, so amazing. But verse 8 through 10 says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is a man who takes refuge in him. O fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. So, again, a summary statement of why we should praise God is because he is so, so good to us. God is so good to us. Verse 8 is an invitation. It's an invitation. Now, whenever I get an invitation, I always feel a little special because it means somebody wants me to be where they are, right? And in verse 8, God invites us to come where he is so that we can experience just how good the presence of God can be. And if we'll do that, if we'll actually go and draw near to God, then according to verse 8, the result is that we'll be blessed. And what does the word blessed mean? In the most simple sense, it means to be happy. And so America wants a therapeutic relationship with God that will make them happy. Well, here it is. Here's the answer right here. Draw near to God. Experience God's goodness, and indeed, you will be happy. But there is a little bit more, though, to that verse, because, or to that that phrase, that section there, because the very next verse, verse 9, tells us, it says, Oh, fear the Lord, you who are saints. Or you who are saints, for those who fear him have no lack. So once again, we're talking about the fear of God again. And the invitation to know God is for everybody, right? For, for uh, like John 3.16, for God so loved the world, is for everybody. But here we see that this omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, sovereign creator of the universe. Those are a bunch of fancy words. It means this almighty, ever-present, all-knowing, all-powerful, the ruler of all rulers, right? We have to come to him on his terms, not ours. As it turns out here in verse 9, God wants the same thing that Aretha Franklin wanted all those years ago. A little R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Find out what it means, not to me, but to him. Fearing God is a critical component of all of our relationships with God, at least it should be. And God expects us Demands from us that we respect him, that we honor him, that we obey him, that we love him. That's part of all that goes into fearing God. And if we'll do that, if we'll respect God and run to him, then God's goodness will indeed provide us with safety and refuge and peace and provision. And we'll lack no good thing because we'll have the best of all things, which is knowing him as our, as our God, as our Savior, as our friend. So that's a good reason to praise and magnify God. Another reason is from verses 11 through 14. It says, 11 through 14 says, Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So the way I summarize those verses is that a third reason to magnify God today is because God actually wants to teach us his ways. He doesn't just tell us who he is and what we have, we got to obey him. He actually shows us, right, how to live our lives and what he's wanting from us, what he's asking from us. And we've already seen again how important it is to fear God. Well, now he gives us some, some ways to do that, right? And he gives, uh, this is not a comprehensive list by any means, but he starts off by telling us, you know, if you're going to fear me, then first of all, you, you need to watch what comes out of your mouth. You've got to guard your words. And that's not easy. Uh, it's not easy because it's very easy to get spun up. It's easy for people to push our buttons. It's easy to be angry and hungry and have a headache and 
look out for all, the, for all those things, right? But we're told here, hmm, guard your, guard your, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. The book of James tells us a lot more about you know, the tongue and how it's lit on, lit on fire by hell itself and how with, with, with one, the same tongue we'll praise God and, the, and but we'll also curse our brothers and the hell that's not to be, that's, that's the wrong way to do it. And yet it is, it is difficult. And we're certainly not to spread lies about other people either. But we get ourselves in all kinds of trouble because of what comes out of our mouth. Words are hard. And then verse 14 gives a very generic statement. It says not to do evil, but to do good. And as the book of Romans starts off by telling us, you know, God's written his laws on all of, of our hearts. And so we all have a general idea from culture to culture, uh, one generation after another. We all kind of have the idea of what's right and wrong. I mean, there's no culture I've ever heard of that says it's good to cheat and steal and lie. Right? We all know those are bad things. Even Democrats and Republicans can agree that it's wrong to kill your neighbor. It's wrong to commit adultery. I mean, basic morality is really not that hard to figure out. What is hard is actually living it out, right? Especially continually and consistently doing what's right. Pursuing peace with those that we don't like and they don't like us. And yet that's what we're called to do. Um, again, this is just a small little short list of how we can fear God by obeying him and following his instruction for our lives because he does know what's best for us. It's not easy, and we fail all the time, which is why we need a redeemer, which we'll get to in a minute. But in the meantime, we should praise God because he has revealed to us his ways and what he wants from us. Billy Graham used to say that if you're ignorant of God's word, then you will be ignorant of God's will. And that is so true. We've got to spend time in his word because that's how he reveals himself to us. That's the best way to magnify God under a microscope is open up his word and see what he says about himself. So again, we've got to, you've got to keep moving on. There's a lot in this psalm. So next, next stop in the psalm is verses 18 and 19. Verses 18, oh, I love this. There's so many great verses in the psalm. Verse 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And so fourth reason to praise God from the psalm is that we, because God is near. He's near to the brokenhearted, and he does deliver us from all our afflictions. Whew, there's a lot of afflictions out there, too. Now, if you didn't already know, there are a lot of people out there that are called health and wealth preachers. Or they believe they, and they adhere to this thing called prosperity theology. And prosperity theology is this belief that it is God's will always for you to be healthy and wealthy as long as you have enough faith, as long as you speak enough positive words over your life, and as long, of course, as you put money in the offering plate. That's God's will. The problem is, I mean, well, first of all, that's a great thing to hear if you're hurting and struggling and broke, right? That God wants to be not struggling and not hurting, and he wants to be wealthy. We want to hear that stuff. But the problem is, is that when we try to exercise our faith and believe in God's goodness, and when we are speaking these positive words of affirmation over my life, and when we're giving sacrificially, and our health doesn't change, our circumstances don't change, we're even more broke down than we were before, what do we do then? Well, we either fill our lives up with guilt that I must be doing something wrong, I don't have enough faith, God's mad at me, or we think, well, maybe God doesn't care that much about me after all because I'm doing all these things he wants me to do, and yet he's still not with me. And you know, again, I, I've seen a lot of health and wealth God, uh, preachers out there, and I've never seen any of, any of them ever advertise a t-shirt with verse 18 on it, especially the second half of verse 18, which says that many are the afflictions of the righteous. Uh, that's another way of saying that a lot of bad things are going to happen to a lot of God's people. You know, the, the word affliction here, I looked it up last week in Hebrew, can be translated in a lot of different ways, none of which, none of which are good. The word affliction can be translated as bad, disagreeable, unpleasant, evil, sad, unkind, wicked, harmful, painful, and distressing. So if we're going to amplify the second half of verse 18, we could say that many, many bad, disagreeable, unpleasant, evil, sad, unkind, wicked, harmful, painful, and distressing things and events are going to happen to you, God's people. Yay! And it doesn't matter how much faith you have. Because here we're talking about the righteous. They're going to experience these things. But praise God that he is indeed near to the brokenhearted. Amen? 
It's one of my favorite verses that God is we're gonna we're gonna have our hearts broken, right? Life is painful. But when we go through those distressing times, and sometimes they're, they just keep piling on top of one another, we do, we can rest assured that God is with me and he has not forsaken me and he's going to watch over me. And, and when I'm talking to people who feel that maybe God's abandoned them, I always try to gently remind them of Jesus and what he went through and how much mental anguish and physical pain and spiritual distress he was under more than we'll ever understand on this side of eternity. And yet Jesus did all those things for us. And indeed, we need to believe, as his promises to us here, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Jesus said something very similar in John 16, verse 33, when he said, in this world you will have tribulation. Some Bibles use the word trouble. I like the word tribulation because it's a, it's a more dramatic word. And the word actually literally means to feel like you're being squeezed so tightly you're about to be crushed to death. And sometimes that's the, the pressures of life, right? You will, Jesus said, you will have tribulation in this world. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Delivers him out of them all. Jesus said, but take heart, but be encouraged because I have overcome the world. So when we go through the hard parts of life. We shouldn't be shocked. We shouldn't be surprised. God promises these things to us, but his, all, his other promise is that he's with us to walk us through these things, to take care of us. At the end of Revelation, we're told that when we get to heaven, that Jesus will wipe, wipe away every tear from our eyes. What does that mean, though? It means we're getting to heaven with some tears, because life can be very painful. So again, it shouldn't shock us. Jesus understood that pain but you know what? There is victory in the end. Amen? There is victory in the end. And that leads us to the fifth and final thing we have time to talk about this morning. Fifth reason to praise God from Psalm 34. And that's found in verse 22. It says, The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. And so we need to praise God because he redeems us and provides us refuge from his judgment and wrath. Now, the most important word in verse 22 is that word redeem. And it's an old military term that goes back to the battlefield when there would be two uh, armies waging war against each other. Inevitably, there would be prisoners of war. And when one army was ready to give up their prisoners of war, they would reach out to the opposing uh, army's uh, commander and say, hey, we'll, we'll sell these prisoners back to you for X amount of dollars. And if the CEO thought these prisoners were worth that amount, then they would pay up. And that transaction was called redemption. If you fast forward to the times of the Roman Empire, where one third of the empire were slaves of one kind or another, there were slaves who were allowed to make money in different, doing different professions. And when that slave had earned enough money to purchase his or her freedom, then guess what? That transaction was called redemption. And so in verse 22, we are told that the Lord redeems the life of his servants. So what has God redeemed us from? Well, God has redeemed us from the imprisonment and the slavery of sin. We're told in Romans, uh, eight, or Jesus told, tells us in John 8, 34, that everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. We're told in Romans 3, 23, for all of sin fall, and fallen short of the glory of God. And what's the consequence of that? Well, Romans 6, 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. And that death is about God's punishment. It is eternal. It is eternal separation from the Lord. We don't like to use the word hell, but that's exactly what we're talking about. For the wages of sin is death. We need a Redeemer. Amen? We need somebody to step in and save us. And that's why I love all of Romans 6.23, which is the Bible in, a, in, a, in one verse. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. That verse was fulfilled by Jesus. If you find your life in him, you will not be condemned. Romans 8, 1, for there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And all you have to do is, is just have real faith and say, I believe, I need you, I'm a sinner, help me, help me, help me, help me. And ultimately, we have a God who saves. We have a God who hears our prayers. We have a God who teaches us his ways. We have a God who is near to the brokenhearted. We have a God who is inviting you and me right now to come near and experience his goodness 
and his love. It's all available to us in Jesus through faith. And a few minutes ago, we, we took the Lord's Supper together. And in the original Last Supper, there were four cups. Jesus passed the third cup to his disciples and said, Take, this is the cup you're going to drink from, which is my blood. That third cup was called, da-dum, the cup, the cup of redemption. Jesus is our Redeemer. I want to end this morning talking about where we began with the first three verses. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Let us pray. Father God, indeed, you are so, so good. Uh, we will never fail to remember that for all eternity, especially as we enter into your presence one day and get to see you for who you truly are and all of your glory. But Lord, until that time comes, help us, God, to look into your word and, and magnify you in our hearts and also with our lips. We know that this world that we live in is very unhappy because they're, they're missing what they were created for, which is to know you and to love you. And I pray that as we walk out of here this morning, you would just remind us, God, that you walk out of here with us. Help us to have a heart for the lost around us, God. Help us to magnify you privately and corporately every day this week because, God, you are indeed good and worthy to be praised and worshiped. And we're so grateful for your love, for our Savior, for our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.